essentially our approach is right now, right here, there are business critical applications that need private LTE networks on CBRS. That's really the clear thing that we have heard from the market. And how do we go make that happen? And the real thing for us when we looked at it was, you know, with all of our combined experience, uh, enterprise Wi-Fi companies, cellular and so on, is we have to remove friction. In the end, it is about all these friction points that we talked about, how do we remove them? And what is going to be the approach to solve that, right? So that's fundamentally it. If you summarize everything about Salona, it's in two words, remove friction. That's our job. We take on whatever we think is friction and we try to solve that. Day one, we identified three things as friction points. Number one, uh, because traditionally LTE has been built for operators, there has not been a significant enough ask of the industry to offer an end-to-end -end package the way we have used to in, say, an enterprise Wi-Fi. So that's problem number one. Just make this look to an enterprise, to the partners going to the enterprise, something that they can deal with the way they're used to. And that's number one, end-to-end -end integration, right? Give them, give the single say-in from management to all those services needed to run the network to the actual radio network, offer it together, right? That was kind of job one. Job two, uh, quite honestly, was born out of our experiences in the enterprise Wi-Fi space. I think over the years, what uh, we realized is we landed in these uh, interesting spots between controllers, cloud, this works in a small place, the other one works here. If I want real simplicity, the plug and play of cloud is awesome, but then when I build large networks, I have this VLAN explosion, how do I solve that? This problem statement has been bugging a lot of us in this industry. And we said, man, we have a clean slate approach finally. How about we go after attacking that? And that was the second bullet that we said, because we are saying all the simplicity people like in this idea of cloud-based networking. How do we offer that without loss of functionality, without loss of sophistication? And that is a groundbreaking architecture that we feel like we are adopting from what people have done quite honestly, there's not a lot of it is not 100% new, but when you apply it to specifically wireless and even more LTE, it introduces challenges that we need to solve. So that's our second point of friction, to say, look, not just make it one package, but create a single architecture that can work whether you're deploying one or two e -Node Bs or a big, big warehouse that's solved it that way. That was the second friction point we're taking on. The third one is really that the whole reason people are considering LTE is there is some application that needs assurance. Otherwise, there is no reason. If you are looking for a best effort technology, we have a phenomenal technology that's working. There's no need for another one. So if that's the whole reason you're looking for LTE, then it is incumbent on the solutions to help these companies get some sort of assurance out of this. And now, that has two connotations. The protocol itself lends itself to a higher degree of assurance, and that helps us a lot but how do you make the operational model so you can use all the tools that this protocol gives you to get that assurance is still a tough problem. And that's the piece where we are leveraging ML and AI in a very pragmatic way, to be honest with you, right? This is not an infinite variables that you need to go solve for. The beauty of this protocol is it's a highly coordinated protocol, but you need to know which knobs, which way, what does it do, and you need to make that work. So that's the three friction points. Offer it in a package that this market can consume. Offer a single architecture that can scale across and still keep the simplicity without loss of sophistication. And third is provide this assurance that customers are looking for by reducing the operational model from humans to as much of machines as possible. So with that goal, you know what this looks like from an overall offering from our perspective is, and this will look familiar to everybody in this, I'm assuming, we have what we call the service orchestrator, which is our cloud-based management system from a user perspective. This is the only thing they log in to create whatever policies, et cetera, they need. This has everything related to the actual network operations, standard stuff, anything needed for the private LTE subscriber management, whether it is physical SIMs, eSIMs when they show up, future if other forms of authentication on LTE and 5G show up, all of that policy management is done from here, including 
mapping it into the enterprise identity stores, which is one of the major things that people struggle with when LTE comes in. And then the last piece is how do we understand applications, how do we understand the load of these applications on this LTE network, and then how do we constantly tune it so that it works to deliver the SLA. All of that, from a console perspective, this is where they go in. This is where they enter those requirements. And after the stuff, when we show you the early version of this demo, it'll be fantastic to get your perspective as well. Now, behind the scenes, this is what the user sees. I see the ability to do all these things. Behind the scenes, this is also where we are doing most of the heavy lifting to say, how do we take these as inputs and then actually do two things? There are two inputs in this, inputs from the user and then inputs from the real network. How do we take both of those and then constantly process them, build new models that work for different parameters, and then push the models down to actually implement them? So all of that brains is here in the cloud. Um, not necessarily cloud in the main, uh, public cloud only. That's one of the big things we started with because we assume that some of these markets that we are going to go in is going to want to do this in the private cloud. So there's no real difference in architecture. The same architecture works public or private. What it means is we need more compute here. And then the second and third layers are really the, I'll call them the operational layers. What we call the service edge, which has, amongst other things, Everything that Mehmet described in the EPC, the data plane, the mobility management and the control plane, all of the radio resource management, if you might, for the equivalent in the LTE, summarized under SON, and a few other services to make this work. But the way we build the service edge, again, is a few basic concepts. No dedicated network appliance. It's software, obviously, today's world. But it is built in a way that each of these services runs as a completely individual microservice. And the value of that for a customer is that all the elements of operations that they are today pains is basically automated. Give you an example. You go in, you start a network, you just want a single eNode B, you plug the eNode B, it will automatically instantiate some service edge components in the cloud, and that eNode B is still fully up and operational. You start to scale, you want to now just have more local control because you have applications. You literally a plug and play x86 server component. Plug it in, it takes the load, no reconfiguration of the RAN, no need to do any more changes to the network, that will take over the load. You want to now add redundancy, you add more servers, they discover each other, they do all of that stuff. Everything here is meant to create that simplicity that we want but don't want to always lose in terms of having on local on-prem stuff. So that's the service edge. Uh, in my language, somewhat like the controller. I, I do not <laughs> want to, but the ability to have that controller not be physical when you don't want it to be. And then there's obviously the radio piece, which is going to be the actual e bees running on the CBRS band, doing LTE for now. and. Uh, these will we'll have both indoor and outdoor up to the power levels that we said. Outdoor is a bigger deal in this segment, quite honestly, than I have traditionally been used to. There are just incredible use cases uh, that make use of the higher power levels and this protocol in those use cases. So that's kind of the uh, solution at a very high level. Uh, let me pause there to see comments, questions, and then we would obviously love more perspectives, yes. I'm, I'm not a cellular expert. E node B equals Equal to access, access point. point, yes. <laughs> yeah, we thought long and hard, by the way. Do we call it access point? Do we call it E node B? And then Mehmet said, I am an engineer in the end. Give it no, the don't, don't put it on me. He won. <laughs> Now, E not be equal to access point. Yeah. Other terms, if you are interested, because they might show up small cell, base station, C what else am I missing? CBSD, I'm so sorry. It's I apologize on behalf of the whole community. A, a glossary it, it, would be nice. A, yeah, is there a sorry? A glossary, and also if you're... <laughs> Great idea. No yeah. matter what you like as an engineer, <laughs> Who are you yes. selling them to <laughs> is a little more important than what it came from. Because if it sounds he, like it. Okay, thanks for this. Yeah. Right. So this will stick Sorry with for me throwing him under the bus. Uh, <laughs> he actually said you need to call it access point, so I'll, I'll actually save him okay. now. Uh, no, but glossary is a great idea. We'll start yeah. to create that right away. Yeah, that's useful. But I, I will say I, I like not calling it an access point, though, simply because that makes it easier to sell as a unique product into a business. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, uh, agreed. I'm just saying if. 
If you need a glossary, you need a marketing person. Because if you have Those to explain the words, <laughs> then you need to come then then come up with your own word rather I get it. than yeah, because I, I think that makes good sense. Point. I, I was having trouble trying to rationalize what the product actually was, considering like the other company that Lee mentioned earlier calls them access points. And, Fair enough. Okay, wait a minute. Where 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 do you guys fit what piece of the I puzzle? I agree. <laughs> Um, the team might be interested in knowing that uh, there is a commercial brand that is circulating on Go for Wi-Fi, equivalent of Wi-Fi for CBRS. So once we have that, then access, coin would, would, access point wouldn't automatically seem that we are talking about Wi-Fi access points. So it wouldn't surprise me if someday we'll hear on Go access points or on Go APs. You know. Yeah. Uh, just, just for clarification, if it was not obvious, CBRS Alliance has branded this as LTE in this band as on-go. And so you might hear the term on-go for that. More stuff to add to our glossary. Yeah, yeah. so one more thing to remember. We will surely clear that. Yeah, there's one more question somewhere. Yeah, uh, so uh, you know, from the engineer standpoint, you just you take your access point in node B, whatever the name yeah. is, and then you plug it to your LAN, yeah. and then you go on the cloud dashboard and you configure it. That's correct. pretty much that how it's going to work. That's exactly right. So, so from a um, yeah, Australia. I just have to give it internet access, and but then you've mentioned that it also ties into my identity stores. So Up then, does it have the ability to go back and drop device A into VLAN A, device B into VLAN B? Yes, yes to both. Um, so let me explain a little bit further. So the sample configuration here you could do is you can say, here is my, we call these network slices, um, the equivalent of the services that we had, SSIDs, right? Um, you call a network slice for IP cameras, and you say my network slice for cameras needs to be allowing these applications, H.264, whatever it is, that gets uh, uh, these SIM identities or these characteristics from the radius, will map the device into this slice. And this is the QoS characteristics that it should get. So it's just QoS, I can't do segmentation at the network level? You can, and you can do the DHCP scope and the VLAN as well, all of the above. So uh, to be honest with you, this is, we'll show you this a little bit in the demo, but this is kind of one of the things that seems obvious when you come at it from an enterprise Wi-Fi perspective and is not so obvious when you come at it from an LTE perspective because of things like EPC, but that's what we, our goal is, to remove the friction and make it as simple as that. Yeah. So from a productization perspective, you're selling the you know, B, the, yes. the box, with a recurring cloud license that we then pay for year over year type of thing? Mm -hmm. Most likely, yes. Oh, wait, okay. so y'all are, look, okay. Because uh, I was confused, because I was thinking you guys were software only and not hardware. No, we are su supplying the access points as well. Didn't you see end to end? I've been lost in alphabet soup. So I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. No, end, uh, end to end includes the yeah. hardware in terms of the access point. Okay. So you're, oh, sorry. Sorry, Sam, go ahead. Meraki for CBRS. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what if you need communications between the CBRS clients <coughs> and your, uh, you, what if you need communications between your CBRS clients and your Wi-Fi clients? Will you be able to allow that when you configure this? It would just connect into the IP network. So they would just have IP okay. network connectivity through the LAN and so nothing just, no, the access method. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much of, uh, I mean, you've got your, your EPC and your, and your on there. How much of that do you see running on-premises versus in the cloud? Great question. Uh, I actually think it will look very similar to how we all think of Wi-Fi design principles today in terms of when your network gets big enough that you don't want to deal with L2 complexities and all of that, you will deploy a node of that service edge on-prem. Anytime it's really small and it's not worth it, you will leave it in the club. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that, we talked a lot about the frequency and so forth. I mean, that's obviously an important part of the sound, right, in this band. Of course, there's a lot of things associated with LTE in terms of how do you configure all these different parameters. 
And uh, on top of that, there's the frequency allocation in the optimal way for an enterprise. So that's, that's one of the key parts of our solution as well. Just wanted what to highlight the, that. What is the device capacity count for a single radio in this world? Yeah. Um, I mean, that definition is a little bit tricky. So I want to uh, be very specific. In the LTE uh, literature, there's the connected devices, right? There's a definition of connected devices. Because uh, if, if you're just looking at devices who are connected at any given time, getting uh, or transmitting or receiving data that can typically go either 64 or 128 in our products. Okay. Uh, but then there are additional hooks in the standard. If you are uh, dealing with many more devices, you can put them on the so-called DRX mode, discontinuous transmission and receive mode, okay. where they can wake up maybe every 10 milliseconds, they can wake up every 20 milliseconds, then you can have like much more uh, number of devices. And the reason that matters is, again, going back to my point on the outdoor, you could really have a yeah. large range covered by one of these. And you can use some of these techniques to kind of increase the capacity of the devices and clients, especially for use cases like IoT use cases. It's very useful yeah. to have that. So and, long range, what sort of distance we go? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you're talking about miles. And if you are really talking about some utility use cases and you know, some uh, remote use case, you can use a very high power 50 watt base station and get close to maybe even 10 mile kind of radius. And uh, just before I forget, in terms of the number of devices, that is not only the number of devices you can support, but also you can sustain them, right? If you remember the control channel sure. uh, distinction I was making, so that really helps. So the quality doesn't degrade as you add more and more devices, right? The LTE preserves the quality of service. If you have some high data rate applications, maybe IP cameras and so forth, you can constantly give them that performance. Meanwhile, you can keep adding many more IoT devices that maybe require connectivity but very low data rate. So theoretically, like if I was the network administrator for say a small city or metropolitan area, I could put up one radio in the middle of town and power the whole city? As depends on, on depends capacity. on the capacity as that as you need, had, right? You, yeah, as long as I had fewer than the max. Uh, usually deployments, and we've been designing a few here, and we've been always noticing that it is almost never coverage uh, limited. It's almost always capacity, capacity. limited. Okay. Exactly. So kind of the same thing we run into. Yeah. It is. But capacity doesn't always mean bits per second, right? Many times we realize it's the number of devices that they That's hit some limitation too. Well, That's we don't right. have to deal with contention in CBRS exactly. like we do in Wi Fi, right? So all of our radios are effectively additive. That's exactly right. Yeah, very, very good way to you summarize want more capacity, it. Capacity, you can just throw in a couple more APs, right? That's exactly. Point. Limited by cost at that point. That is, right. that is right. So it occurs to me that most devices today only have the capability of a single SIM card. Uh, some of them now are, are dual SIM. I don't know anything that's more than that other than if you're talking about eSIM. This network is SIM authenticated. Does that mean that your primary use case is going to be dedicated devices, not devices that will talk to your CBR, to the, to the CBRS network and some other network, but rather yeah. devices that stay on your network all the time and don't roam around to other things? Great question. You want to take it? Yeah. Go so ahead. Firstly, a SIM card does not automatically imply only one network. Right? A SIM card can still have the concept where it can support multiple networks. But it has to do with the network selection, right? Absolutely. So exactly. the SIM card would have to be something provided. Exactly. Like so I can as take a, a Verizon SIM and use it to authenticate. As long as Verizon does not want to do that, that is true. Okay. But if two, let's call them network operators, decide that a single SIM should work on both, that is doable. Okay. And so I think that's the, I mean, we can go into the details offline for sure. But it's yeah. really not a technology limitation. Yeah, I was making Purely a willing if yeah. you were really targeting it for dedicated devices or if you had a plan or, or something. Yeah, like I think our honest opinion is we are seeing enough demand in that type of scenarios that we feel like we can really go get momentum through that. Okay. And it quite honestly removes distraction for all of us. Right. Product people, partners who are going after mm -hmm. these opportunities, et cetera. And we think there is a possibility in the future that other scenarios open up. 